Nu man är på det så blir det ingen spelade sång team. Amen. We have the feast today of Saint Ignatius of Loyola, um, a great saint in the church and founder of um, probably one of the most infamous orders in the church today, the Jesuits. Um, I can I can barely say the word without f- feeling like I have to make a joke about it. But anyways, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the life of Saint Ignatius, but then more I think on the um, a, a few thoughts on the great misunderstanding of obedience that people have today. Um, is St. Ignatius, uh, when, it would fa- when he founded the, um, uh, the Jesuits, um, he added a fourth vow of, uh, of, of obedience. The, the, the members would take a vow, a special vow of obedience. Uh, but we, we'll, we'll get to that, we'll get to that. Uh, so he was born in 1491 in the town of Loyola in Spain. He was the youngest of 13 children. And he grew up uh, loving the legends of uh, like, uh, chivalry and courtship. So this is, uh, you know, so when he was a young, a young man, you know, around 10 years old or so, 10, 12, et cetera, uh, it, it had been about 50 or 60 years um, uh, since the invention of the printing press. And so you had the legends of El Cid, uh, Roland, um, uh, King Arthur, et cetera, and was very much just enamored with, with these uh, courtly tales. Uh, that's when you get uh, Cervantes would write uh, Don Quixote uh, around the same time. Um, so uh, so he, he, was, he was for 30 years, uh, he lived not a very good life. He, in court, uh, they said he was a womanizer, he was a great dancer. He himself admitted he would spend hours arranging his hair in the mirror right before going out. Um, it's even said that he, he had killed a man in uh, participating in a duel. So this, and, and he, he um, um, started out in court, then he, he joined the military. Um, you know, the, the great um, f- uh, um, fortune, like the best thing that happened to him in his life was getting shot in the legs with a cannonball. Uh, because it woke him up, right? It's, it broke one of his legs and severely uh, mangled the other one, such that uh, when he was he was um, uh, 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 convalescing or in the hospital, doctors told him, "Prepare for death. Your your, your leg is so wounded that there's so much uh, gangrene, right? Uh, infection. You're not going to make it." So that that affected uh, his conversion because when he was recovering, I mean, he, he did recover, and this is before anesthesia. Like he's getting his leg rebroken; it wasn't healing right. They rebroke it to heal it properly. They amputated part of his legs, right? No anesthesia. So he's enduring this this great pain, and there's nothing to read. He, I don't, I can't remember where he was convalescing, but there was it was the Bible and the lives of the saints, and he began reading this and really thinking, you know, what am I doing with my life? Right, that very important question. So this is where he has uh, his, his conversion, and it's, 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 it's one of those wonderfully complete conversions that happened all at once. And so after recovering, he goes and, and lives in a cave for eight months, um, uh, praying and fasting and begging alms and so on. Uh, even even takes a, a trip to the Holy Land to do a pilgrimage. And, and this is where he really um, kind of solidifies his conversion. Um, this is also where he would um, kind of write, he kept a journal or a diary. This is where in this, this eight months after his, his uh, um, recovery, he would um, come up with his spiritual exercises. And that is uh, the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola is I think the most um, um, rigorous and like the, 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 uh, if you're gonna do a retreat, there's no more difficult retreat that the church has than the Ignatian retreat of Ignatius of Loyola. Right, because he, he was a soldier. And what he did was he took his, his military principles and applied them to the spiritual life. That's what they're called spiritual exercises. Just like he says, you, you exercise the body, you can exercise the soul in a similar manner. You, you gotta do these things every day and you can build up uh, uh, skills and strengths and so on and so forth. So he, he wants to, uh, he wants to, do, to do more and um, he wasn't uh, ignorant, but he didn't have a good education. So at, at, you know, in his early 30s, he goes back to grammar school. Um, you know, so he's surrounded by little kids, right? You ever seen that, what was that movie, Billy Madison, I think. Uh, it's, you got this grown man sitting in a class, classroom with a bunch of kids, and he doesn't care. It, t- it takes a great amount of humility to go back to school, but he did because he wanted to learn more. He wanted to learn philosophy and theology, um, and eventually he would become a priest. But this is the beginning of it, so, so a great deal of, of humility on his part, but it, it also shows that's what, what, that's what somebody does when you have a, a goal. Like, I want to accomplish this, I want to do this for God, I want to accomplish this good thing, and so uh, a pride goes out the window, and all you focus on is the goal, and that's, that's what he did. He would eventually end up going to Paris to study at the university, 
and he would meet up there with uh, Peter Faber, uh, Father Peter Faber, uh, Saint Peter Faber, uh, um, 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 Francis Xavier, um, and and just like all like this 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 all star cast of, of saints, and he would gather uh, eventually nine companions to him, and they would found the order of the Jesuits in uh, the um, in the church on um, it was a um, well, it's right next to the Basilica Sacre Coeur. It's on Montmartre in Paris. So they would I think it's a Church of Saint Peter or something like that. But he would, uh, um, that's where they would found the Jesuit order, and they vowed they wanted to go propagate. They wanted to go out and, and, and spread the gospel among all the, all the, uh, all the lands. Um, that's what you have in, in today's gospel. It was uh, the passage uh, where our Lord is saying, sending them out two by two. And this is when you go, you know, go out two by two to all the towns and preach the gospel and bring neither staff nor script or whatever. Just, just go and preach. So, so that, that was the uh, um, kind of the uh, uh, des- desire of the Jesuits from the beginning, was they were, they were a missionary order. <clears throat> and they, they um, traveled to Rome, and they asked to uh, be sent on the missions. And um, uh, I, think, I think originally they wanted to go to the Holy Land, and the Pope said, I don't need people in the Holy Land. It's a little bit too dangerous now, but, um, you know, I need, other, I need people to go to the East, the Indies. And so that's what they did. That's, that's how uh, St. Francis Xavier ends up going and being the great saint that he was, is he was sent by St. Ignatius of Loyola, and they had gotten the commission from the Pope to go evangelize the Indies. So that's, that's how, how that occurred, and we, and we know the results. St. Peter Xavier, uh, 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 Francis Xavier, had incredible uh, uh, conversions. Millions of people converted because of his efforts. Um, and this also was where um, the Jesuits really placed themselves at the service of, of the papacy, whatever the Pope needs. I, like um, Other orders would say, we're going to focus on this, we're going to focus on this. The Jesuits was, we're going to focus on whatever the Holy Father wants us to do. You were like we're we're we're, you're, we're you're at, at your at your beck and call. We're at your disposal, uh, and it was it was very good at that time. Uh, it, it, there was quite a bit that, that that was done in the Indies by Francis Xavier, um, <clears throat> but also they um, there was missionary activity at home as well. Um, and what what they ended up doing, so Ignatius and his companions uh, uh, shared their knowledge by means of uh, teaching other priests and founding a seminary there in Rome. Um, they also founded schools, colleges, and, and seminaries all over Europe, and the one in Rome was called the Roman College, and that lasted until 1870, I think with the fall of the Papal States. Afterwards, it became known as the Gregorian University, and that is the, uh, one of the seminary colleges uh, even today still in Rome. Uh, he would also give, St. Ignatius would give uh, excellent retreats, as I mentioned, using his spiritual exercises. Uh, the order became instrumental in combating the Protestant heresies uh, uh, in Europe at the time. And, um, and there are very, very many notable uh, uh, Jesuits uh, that came out of the order. So as I mentioned, St. Francis Xavier. Also, Matteo Ricci uh, would, would be a missionary to the Chinese. You have the North American martyrs in Canada, uh, John de Brebeuf and so on, uh, uh, Isaac Jogues. Uh, St. Peter Claver would go to South America, and Father John DeSmet would go to the American Northwest, right, Idaho, Montana, that area. Uh, so uh, a tremendous legacy uh, left by the Jesuits and tremendous efforts. Um, and I, I would say also <coughs> uh, these days um, <coughs> a, a, a tremendous misunderstanding about what um, Ignatius was trying to do with his virtue of obedience. And that, that, was the, that was a very big thing, just like um, heroic obedience. Uh, every, every order um, has a charism, um, a charism of like the Franciscans is, is uh, um, poverty and the Dominicans is preaching. And everybody's called to, to do that, right? Uh, you know, everybody, every monk and nun takes a vow of poverty, but the, the Franciscans have a special devotion to that vow of poverty, right? And they, 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 they seek to display it in an extraordinary way. And so for the Jesuits, what they took as their special charism was the, the, the vow of, of obedience, is we're going we're to display obedience in an extraordinary manner. But it's, it's, it's one of the, um, it's one of the uh, hardest things to do, and it's also, it, it can be the easiest to go wrong. And it's, it sounds strange, but with, with poverty, a vow of poverty, you sacrifice uh, like personal comfort, and you sacrifice security of not knowing what you're going to have from day to day. Um, <coughs> chastity is obvious, you know, you sacrifice that kind of natural desire of man for a supernatural desire. I'm not going to propagate physical children. We'll propagate uh, na- uh, supernatural children. Uh, the virtue of, 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 of uh, obedience sacrifices the will. 
Um, and that's, that's the hardest to do because that was where Satan went wrong, non serviam. It was a refusal of the will to serve God and Adam and Eve. God told them not to eat of the fruit and they did anyways. So sacrificing the will is uh, uh, very difficult. Uh, and and that, is, that is what um, uh, you, you know, everybody does, but the Jesuits wanted to show it in a particular manner. Uh, however, it would be a mistake uh, to take um, you know, a monastic virtue and say that every single person in the church needs to uh, take a vow of obedience, right? It, that doesn't work. Just like you can't have every single person in the church taking a vow of poverty. That's not what lay people are for. Um, furthermore, <coughs> um, uh, uh, um, the saints had special charisms personally. Um, St. Francis, uh, uh, um, uh, Francis of Assisi, he, his vow of poverty was so strict that uh, he would not keep anything from one day to the next. He would beg his food for that day and that day only. If he had more food at the end of the day, he would give it away, and they would beg the next day. Now go ahead and try asking every single um, uh, 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 Franciscan order, if you have any money in the bank, get rid of it. If you have any food in your pantries, get rid of it. All of you have to beg your food from one day to the next. Impossible. Like um, One of the saints who tried that, uh, I, once you start getting more and more people, gathering around you, you have to, you can't just take, take these individual uh, uh, um, charisms and apply them to a large group. Uh, there are certain charisms only that particular saints have, and, and you cannot replicate that. That's, that's, that's not, that's not uh, uh, feasible. Um, the Norbertines, found, the St. Norbert, founder of the Norbertines, he tried to have uh, to all of his followers follow his own uh, very rigorous method of fasting. What happened? His first three followers died from malnutrition. They couldn't do it, right? So Ignatius of Loyola had an incredible uh, vow of obedience. He would say once, uh, like, um, if, if, you know, if I was given the command by the Pope to believe that white was black and black was white, like, I would do it. If he's like, if I was told to get on a leaky boat and that it was, you know, already sinking, I would get on it. And, you know, they told me, go to the Holy Land. I would get on that boat unhesitatingly and, 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 and go sink in the ocean, go into... Okay, that, that, that's wonderful. That, that shows a complete um, submission of the will to a heroic degree. You know, to take that and say that everybody in the church, everybody in your order needs to have that is, is a misapplication of it. Because uh, let's, let's recall that, that, that a, a, a vow of obedience is a sacrifice of the will and it's an act, it's a positive thing. Obedience is not an absence of something. Dogs are obedient, right? Uh, even even uh, a wicked men can be obedient to a wicked superior and, and do wicked things. That's not a virtue. Right? So the virtue of obedience is always an act of sacrificing the will of what I would rather do in favor of what, you know, th this, this um, uh, command of my superior. But that all has to take place within uh, the realm of morality. Once you step out of morality and you begin, uh, you're given wicked orders, even when it's from a, a legitimate authority, um, the obedience ceases to exist. You know, when you obey a wicked order, um, there, is no, there is no virtue there. Uh, everything it's part of the virtue of uh, the, the the principle of integrity so uh, th this is this is something that that I, I i just mentioned today because um the 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 world is so different than it was in saint ignatius's time the church is so different you know in saint ignatius's time you know the cardinals that there was corruption there was um uh, there was simony there there was there was uh, um, uh, nepotism and all kinds of things but the the uh the, the pope right the integrity of the faith the doctrine was absolutely clear Right? And especially with, with, with the Protestant heresy, uh, there, there was a clear demarcation of this is absolutely what the church believes, this is what was always believed. And you had wicked bishops who were uh, 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 wealthy and luxurious and having children absolutely firm on doctrine. <clears throat> and so it was easy for St. Ignatius to take a vow of obedience because there was no, uh, the, 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 um, the enemy was clear, right? The, 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 the heresy was clear and it was clearly on the outside. What happens if you take a vow of obedience now uh, without exception? I'm going to obey any, any church leader above me no matter what. Uh, the crisis now is not a crisis. Well, there's many crises. Among it is doctrine. There's a crisis of doctrine. You know, um, there are men in the church who are heretics, and that can be proved. They'll say things and do things like that is absolute heresy, and nothing is done. You take a vow of obedience to that person, right? You're, you're knowingly putting yourself in a da very dangerous position. So uh, that's, that's just um, uh, something that, that we all to keep in mind with, with the saints, you know, uh, and, and with their, um, the various examples, you follow their love of God. 
you, you can't follow exactly their, their penances, you can't follow exactly their fastings, you can't follow exactly their vow of obedience or their vow of poverty, uh, you can't follow their vow of obedience exactly. That's a special charism. Uh, so, but, but, um, uh, so keep that in mind. Obedience to within certain bounds is, is necessary, uh, but it has to, you have to understand what are those bounds. Uh, in any case, um, Ignatius himself would eventually die on this day, July 31st, in the year 1556, almost 65 years old. And even at the time of his death, I think there was, his order had a thousand members. They'd founded many schools and colleges. Uh, and so he, he had that, that um, uh, um, joy of seeing uh, um, what a conversion can do. Not everybody has that, but he, he lived 30 years in, 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 in wickedness. Uh, and then the 35 years afterwards, he was able to see uh, a great success. Uh, and so we won't always see that, but we can always ex uh, uh, follow that example of giving ourselves entirely to Christ, uh, especially through obedience to Christ uh, and possession of the virtues, uh, and making sure we understand what they really are. Uh, so let's ask St. Ignatius of Loyola for his uh, uh, blessing and help, especially in the world today. May God bless you all in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.